welcome to uh, my latest podcast. This is Todd Rosenfeld again from Securities Training Corporation, the Chief Learning Officer. And we're going to spend a few minutes, a uh, little time on Regulation BI, a Regulation Best Interest, which is effective June 30th, 2020. It was actually created about almost about a year before that. So it's the summer of 2020, a very interesting summer going on with COVID and everything else around the world. But we want to talk a little bit about the regulation, how it affects the business to some degree. And again, this is not a course on regulation BI. It's informational. It's casual. I'm not going to list items. It makes no sense to do that. But when you think about the history of it pretty quickly, we have two kind of separate entities in the financial service industry. And we have broker dealers. We have an investment advisory firm. So those are the two pillars. The broker dealer community mainly uh, makes money or trend, you know, profitability on transactional based compensation. You buy a stock, you buy a bond, you might pay a commission, you might pay a markup, you buy a mutual fund or an annuity product or something like that. You might pay a built in sales charge or sales load. You might have trailer commissions with those products. If there's uh, underwriting, there is a underwriting spread, which is a transactional base fee. So that's kind of the broker dealer community. The advisory community says, well, we're going to charge clients a fee, usually based on their assets, you know, how much money they have under management. That fee will be ongoing. They may or may not charge you some type of uh, transactional based compensation because some firms are both. So some firms are only investment advisory firms. Some firms are only broker dealers, but many firms are a combination of, of both. So, and remember what had happened prior, uh, there was uh, the, the talk of, okay, uh, an advisor is a fiduciary where a broker dealer has to disclose conflicts, but she doesn't know, necessarily have to avoid them. It's a whole controversy around that. And then afterwards, we had something called the DOL, Department of Labor's fiduciary rule years ago, which uh, basically said that any retirement funds, because the DOL can kind of regulate that stuff, any retirement funds like an IRA, a 401k, any of those profit sharing plans, they had to be managed based upon a fee, not transactional based compensation because of the, the conflicts of interest. But again, that was a, a DOL policy. But it wasn't a specific rule per se. And then what happened is a little change in administration, some changes going on, court case kind of uh, put the nicks on the DOL's rule. And then we had what's called regulation BI, or best interest, which kind of is a little bit like that, but it doesn't, this isn't targeted just to retirement accounts. So in essence, I think it's a little cleaner because saying, well, you can charge clients on any type of account either fees, asset-based fees, or transactional-based compensation, as long as you put the client's best interest in front. Now, the advisor community had always been having a duty, duty of loyalty, a duty of care to all their clients, but the broker-dealer community only had suitability rules. So this kind of puts things together. I think, I think the SEC did a great job on this. I think it provides a lot of clarity. It also talked about some of the Advisors Act kind of, you know, exemptions and disclosures. One pretty interesting thing that I want to spend a few minutes on is, you know, in many brokerage firms, they use this term called discretionary account where the broker dealer, the, the, the registered person can buy and sell as long as they receive power of attorney. But most clients, you know, don't have those accounts at broker dealers or there's limited discretion, you know, someone's traveling or, or someone is trading for third party, like a, you know, like a relative or something like that. But the advisor community had always done the transactional based, you know, discretion where they would charge you a fee, then they would choose investments for you as long as you sign the power of attorney, because they weren't making money on the number of trades, they were making money on just the assets and the management. So there's no incentive for them to overtrade the account. So that's been, the, you know, they kind of clarified that, which is pretty good. And, and now they did a, a good job of providing the, the pros and cons of that. But I will tell you that in the business is people use this term financial advisor, uh, you know, uh, I'm an advisor, but we never said like, what does that actually mean? So what regulation you know, what, what the regulation did is clarify that it says, okay, 
You could not use the term advisor in your title unless you were what's called an IAR, an investment advisor rep, which means you had to have either a 65, sorry, 65 or 66. So in essence, kind of let me boil it down. So let's say you worked at a brokerage firm, you're you know, a registered person, and if you receive transactional based compensation, you'd be licensed series seven, you take the SI and the seven. And if you were a, um, you, want, you, were, you, were, you wanted to get fee based income, you would be what's called an investment advisor rep of an investment advisor. So you would take the SIE, the seven and the 66. And many people do that. You know, they want to be able to, you know, be flexible with their clients charge one type of compensation or another type of compensation, depending upon what the client wanted, which is great. So in essence, they had a little bit of every now what happened was the series 66 can only be taken if you have a seven and what the 66 was or still is today is a combination of state law requirements for both transactional based compensation, which is like the old, the 63 exam and the advisory side, which is something called the 65. So in essence, you would take the SIE, the seven and 66, and that would comp and basically that would qualify you for anything you'd want to do. Now, if you were, let's say licensed, as a, a person that sold mutual funds, annuity contracts, maybe work for one of the insurance companies, things of that nature, many of those people have something called the Series 6 and then a 63, and they would have to take the 65. So the 65 would be the investment advisory portion. Uh, so a person who worked for an insurance company wanted to charge fee-based income, you know, an asset-based fee, would have to take the 65 and both exams are pretty, pretty tough. But the key is by, by doing this, by, by having the advisor side, you could charge clients a fee. You wouldn't over trade the account. And some people would like that. And one of the other great things regulation BI did is it talked about more than just suitability. Now FINRA has a, a suitability rule. And the basic suitability rule says, before you recommend the product to your client, you got to go through three things. Number one, is the product suitable for at least some of your clients? Number two, even though it might be suitable for some of your clients, it's suitable for these clients. And even if it's suitable for these clients, how much of that product or products should they have? So that's kind of the three pillars. Well, the most important of the three being the second one. I mean, it's got to be suitable for somebody, some clients. So a leveraged ETF might be suitable for some of your clients, but not all your clients. Which ones is it suitable for? And if they, even where they're investing in that, how much should they invest in that product, which is, is pretty good. What Regulation BI did is add to that. It's not just product-based, it's any recommendation. So for example, uh, if you recommend someone's, hey, I got a 401k, I'm retiring. Now I'd like to move and roll over that money to an IRA so I can invest in whatever I want. That's considered a recommendation. Should they roll over that 401k to a, an IRA? Hey, I want to open a margin account. I have a regular account. That's a recommendation. And what's really good is, is that they set these things called the active accounts. And they talked about that you know, an active account, meetings with, with your clients. Anytime you meet with a client on a regular basis, and depending what type of account is, that's considered a recommendation because you're either going to tell the client to buy some more of this, sell some more of that, stay the course. Even if you tell the client just to hold, it's still considered a recommendation, which is great. You know, it's good to meet with clients because let's face it, you know, when you think about your goals, Health, obviously, is the number one thing and family, of course, and other things. But one of the most underlooked, but very important, is financial health. And financial health doesn't mean, oh, I'm up 10%, I'm up 8%, I'm doing this. It, it also means, what are my goals? What are, what, what are my family's goals? You know, for example, we've had lots of people recently saying, you know, maybe I don't want to live in a metropolitan area. Maybe I want to, instead of renting, I want to buy. The question is, you need to make a down payment in many cases or afford a mortgage. 
But to make that down payment, did you set aside funds? So what's your goal? Um, I have young children. I want to put money away for them for college. I want to retire. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to retire early and start a new business. These are goals that are very important to a person. And by meeting with your financial advisor, whether you charge them fee-based or, or transactional-based compensation is important. I've noticed that, especially lately, when people have had a lot of time, that it's really, really good to set goals. Now, we know it's really important you know, to set the goals, but let's take it a step further. Some people have online accounts, which are great. Uh, they, you know, they, where they don't have a specific financial advisor and, and they make their own transactions, they make their own decisions, which is great. People, knowledge is power and individuals have that, you know, can do that. But I think that maybe online they can have ways and they do have these things where they allow you to kind of do your own self check. So how you do the checks, whether it's individually meeting with someone, which a lot of people prefer, or it's online through some, some type of a system that says, you know, here are my goals. I want to do this and I'm going to put money aside. So I think the whole idea of regulation best interest is important in analyzing the financial health. Now, a couple of other things we want to talk about, you know, in, in, in this process is regulation BI only applies to what's called a retail customer, which is interesting because prior to regulation BI, if you ask someone, what is a retail client? You get it like, maybe 20 different answers. In actuality, there was never a definition of a retail client. Now, FINRA did have a definition of an institutional client and listing you know, banks, saving institutions, trust companies, investment advisors, they listed a bunch of things and any individual account where assets in that account, you know, in that firm was $50 million. So they never had a definition of retail but they had a definition of institutional. So if you weren't institutional by default, the non-institutional was retail. Well, what Regulation BI did, which I think is a, is a really good move, is they did not set a dollar limit. They said a retail customer is any customer that's not an institutional investor, an individual. Whether he or she had you know, $10,000 to invest or $100 million, $100 million to invest, they're still considered retail clients, which I think is a, is a good move. And what they also did is they said, okay, we're going to create a form, a really easy form called a customer relationship summary, CRS. What we're going to do is, is we're going to make it short and sweet. You know, if you only do one type of business, it's going to be two pages. If you do both types of business, it'll be more, more than four pages. So, for example, uh, you might get a, a summary, uh, you know, it's a two-pager on the broker-dealer side or a two-pager on the advisor side or a four-pager when they have both. And it asks some really good questions. It's, it basically says, this is what we do. This is how we charge you. And one of the interesting things they say, which is right, is they say, whether you make money or not, we still get compensated. And, and that's a fair disclosure because if you trade a lot, you can pay a lot of commissions or you trade a lot and, you, and there's a fee, they're going to make the fee whether you make money or lose. It's their incentive though for, you to, for them to make money because who wants to lose money? So therefore the firm's incentive is to grow your assets you know, for a goal or, or, or for a good return. Because you, you, you want to be able to do something with those funds. You know, you have excess funds, your retirement funds, things of that nature. What I think is, is a great idea. So we, we have that information. There are goals that are set. Whether or not, you know, and, and they actually have some hyperlinks. Hey, you want more information? We have disclosure problems. We have disciplinary action. Click here. So they've done a great job on that. And I think going forward, FINRA had to change a few of its rules. Uh, there was a rules on sales contest where they specifically said that, you know, the regulation BI says you can't have a sales contest for a specific product because, of course, everyone's going to sell that product. It's, in, it's an incentive to sell. But again, you know, whether or not you do things yourself or you have an advisor is as an individual, it's always going to be good to do some check-ins. You know, if you're a, you're a financial advisor, you have your clients, 
you know, quarterly or semi-annually reviews with your clients. I mean, we do that in our business at Security Training Corporation. We call them QBRs, quarterly business reviews. They're great. Clients know what you're up to. And they, I think that translates in the advisory business and the broker dealer business. I've had someone that I've dealt with for many years. I meet with them every quarter. Uh, sometimes it's good news. Sometimes it's bad news, but there's always new just to go through things. It's something, it's like, it's, thing check, it's almost like a checkup. And it doesn't have to be every quarter. It could be every year, every six months, whatever you feel comfortable doing with the clients. So I, I think maybe some people did it, some people didn't. But if you look at the regulation, BI provides clarity on that. You know, it, you know, duty of care, duty of loyalty. If there's conflicts, disclose them. If like, for example, there might be disclosure that says, there's a conflict saying, we might recommend a product and that entity who gives sells that product might give us an incentive. Okay, it happens. I mean, we look to say, okay, well, we're paying, we want to do things that are less expensive. I understand that. But remember, as a financial advisor, you are very important. Whether you work for a large firm or small firm, you're providing financial advice to your clients. We should treat them with the best interest. But the same token, you know, the same the same idea is we, we want to make sure that these people need to be compensated as well. So we pay for a lot of other things. Why not pay for financial advice? Whether it's an ongoing fee, it doesn't have to be free. You know, and, and, and again, however the financial advisor charges, what's best for their clients? Now, if you're only a broker dealer, that's the only way you could charge. Well, the form says that on the information it says, this is the way we make money. We don't. We are limited in what we can sell you. We only have these products or these services. They're telling you up front. So if you go to a firm and you want a specific product and they don't have that product, they're telling you they don't have that product. You may need to go someplace else. It doesn't mean you have to use one firm. You might want to use one firm. Or as a, as a financial advisor, you might say, you know, I feel comfortable only recommending these products. So from both the points of view of the financial advisor, broker dealer advisor, and the point of view of the client, what works best for both? Some advisors, again, feel comfortable with, with a certain product. We only want equities or bonds. We don't sell a lot of packaged products. And the reverse. There's nothing wrong with any of those products. And even some products that might be speculative could be okay, as long as they're limited a certain percentage of your portfolio. Okay, just a couple more things uh, for this podcast. One is the following. These forms, this information, although the rule goes in effect June 30th, as far as the form, the CRS form, look for it. I'm sure your firms have done some type of training. But again, if you're a new retail investor, you got to deliver this form anytime a client opens an account, places an order, or receives a new recommendation. For any existing customers, sometime in the summer of 2020. So it's going to happen pretty soon to almost all clients. You know, any new client going forward, any existing client gets the form. The second thing I want to mention is FINRA did mandate some type of training. I mean, the idea is, is FINRA put out a, an FAQ and one of the names, should you should they be training? Yes. And how the training is done, you know, it, it really depends on the firm. So for example, some firms might have done training already. They might have online training. It might have been in a live presentation. It could be a number of different ways. Securities Training Corporation has done a few things. Um, first of all, we uh, create an online module. Like a lot of firms do, we do a CE module going through all the bells and whistles, which I think is great. However, uh, there's two other ways. One is, and I've done this once already, and we will uh, be doing a few more for specific clients who are saying, you know, I have these meetings anyway. I need to check the reg reggae BI box that we've done the training and maybe a, an interactive methodology. You can't do it live now because of what's going on, but you can do a WebEx or some type of a virtual training where, you know, you incorporate, let's say an STC with your own people. They talk about the firm's policies and procedures, and we talk about the rule in general. And we, this is what we do for a living. You know, sometimes people in compliance who do the training say, boy, I, I'm really good at what I do. Just like I can't be a, you know, I'm not a compliance officer. I'm in the training world. And the people who work in my group also, and we're really good at making live presentations, what we do for a living. 
And again, anytime we deliver that, people can feel comfortable. We're going to do a bang up job. We're going to be dynamic. We're going to be uh, entertaining. We'll give good examples and we'll target the program to the audience. So we, we enjoy doing that. And I think we do a great job at it. The second is there's an annual compliance meeting. And sometimes we do online versions and we will do a recorded version, sort of like a mini WebEx program. Uh, with some questions at the end, um, we'll do a, a, sort of like a video. You don't need to see me or anyone on my team, but you can hear us like a, an on-demand presentation. So I think um, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. I think it should be ongoing. Uh, this is year one. Again, I really feel strongly that, that the rule written provides clarity in the business. I think it's uh, beneficial for both clients and the firms, people in the industry, people new to the industry. And that's a really great thing. And the last thing I just want to mention is that so sometimes people ask us, when do they think regulation BI will be on some of the licensing exams? Uh, I don't think for, you know, it won't be on all the exams. It'll be on some of them. I don't think it'll be a big, uh, a big testable item. There might be a, you know, a couple of questions, one or two at most, maybe experimental four or five in the beginning, uh, probably in the fall, maybe even later than that. It doesn't change. It changes the business. Definitely. Again, I think for the better. Uh, and you can test these things. Of course, the question is you would test it differently on a rep exam versus a principal exam on the rep exam. You'd want to, you know, you want to make sure that the rep knows what they need to do to satisfy the requirements of reg BI. Where on a principal test, like the 24, the nine, 10, You'd want to test the compliance of it as a manager. So there's two points of view there for the record keeping disclosure requirements, you know, it might be more principles related where the actual business side of it is, you know, the definition of a retail client, what do you need to do? And of course, what's considered a recommendation would all be fair game for, you know, for the licensing examination. So again, I hope you enjoy your summer. It's the beginning of the summer, 2020. Hope you enjoyed the podcast on Regulation BI. Lots more podcasts to come. I really enjoy doing these, and I hope you enjoy listening to them. Uh, next time, signing out again. Enjoy your summer. This is Todd Rosenfeld.